Welcome back to Unpacking the Epidemic of Loneliness. As I dig deeper into what the real problem is that's bringing about this increase in loneliness across the globe and across all ages. I read the 80 page report from the US Surgeon General's Advisory Committee titled Our Epidemic of Loneliness. And I'll say that combing through all of this information was not only overwhelming, it also led me down a lot of rabbit holes. First and foremost, I like to look at things from a sociological perspective. I guess since I have a degree in sociology, I like to look at things from the top down. From there, I go into the psychology of things, the cognitive functions and the behaviors of how our society impacts us. And then I break down the epidemiology, which is at the cellular level of our genes and DNA, getting into the field of epigenetics. I'm going to talk about a few things as I go through this report, but the main focus is going to be on the genetic disposition toward loneliness. The advisory says that it draws upon decades of research from scientific disciplines of sociology, psychology, neuroscience, political science, economics, public health. Overall, they say that despite all of the info that they've gathered, further research is still required. The government claims that they're here to address social health, systemic, and global issues of concern, but what's really happening is they're exacerbating the problem. Addictions, homelessness, health issues, mental health issues, poverty, and now loneliness. We're not finding solutions. We're stockpiling problems. And one thing I know is that a system that created a problem usually cannot be the one to solve it. The system of capitalism eventually needs to be replaced because what I've discovered is that loneliness is rooted in capitalistic expectations and ideals. And the way we have responded to capitalism is through social isolation. People say that to go outside costs the money. They're saying the streets are too expensive. Every time I step outside my door, that's another $20. We have to stop consuming and we need to start creating. Our purpose as humans is not to be consumers of products and services. Our purpose is to create a life on earth that is built upon the things that already exist. We're all trapped in homes that we can't afford, eating food that's too expensive, and trying to repair hundreds of years of intergenerational trauma within our family systems, while non-alcoholic beverages have become more expensive than alcohol, and self-medicating has become more effective than prescribed medications. The cure for loneliness may not be social connection, as much as it is a social revolution. That's what we're all waiting for. For now, let's look at what this report from the advisory committee is wanting us to know. First, the report distinguishes the difference between social isolation and loneliness. So let's start with that. According to the advisory, they say that social isolation and loneliness are related, but they're not the same. Social isolation is objectively having few social relationships, social roles, group memberships, and infrequent social interaction. Well, cue the loners, hermits, and introverts. It goes on to say that loneliness is a subjective internal state. It's the distressing experience that results from perceived isolation or unmet need between the individual's preferred and actual experience. So if I perceive that my level of social connection is normal, then I won't feel so lonely. But despite my perception, I'm still subject to the harmful effects of social isolation. There are some statistics presented that loneliness and social isolation increase the risk for premature death by 26 and 29% respectively. And what they've highlighted is that if someone is alone and they have a health crisis or an emergency, it's less likely that they're gonna get the response they need in time to be helped. But these stats are pretty close. So socially isolated or lonely, it doesn't matter because you could feel lonely while surrounded by people all day long. Either way, your risk of premature death is gonna be the same. And of course, the report needs to let us know the cost that social isolation is having to our healthcare system. 
Among older adults alone, it accounts for an estimated $6.7 billion in excess Medicare per year. In the U.S., stress-related absenteeism attributed to loneliness cost employers an estimated $154 billion per year. <laughs> that's a lot of money. Stress-related absenteeism that's related to loneliness, that's attributed to loneliness. How do they know that? We're getting tired of office politics and toxic workplaces and doing too much for way too little pay. And guess what? Humans aren't meant to go to work to do the job of three people, no matter how much money you give them. We're not robots. And I suppose that's why so many of our human jobs are being threatened to be replaced by robots. They tell us that social connection is a fundamental human need as essential to survival as food, water, and shelter. Throughout history, our ability to rely on one another has been crucial to survival. You know what else is crucial? Our ability to understand the various needs that humans have, and that not all of us are the same, and not all of us fit into your solution that social connection is going to be the cure to our loneliness. They tell us, however, that now, even in the modern times, we human beings are biologically wired for social connection. I found this article that speaks exactly to that. Oh, the innate drive to seek social bonding and the subsequent rewards and stresses associated with its attainment and loss are deeply ingrained. It's worth noting that addictive drugs targeting the same neural mechanisms that are naturally designed to facilitate social attachments, leading to the proposition that social bonding can be seen as the primary form of addiction. Something many of us have evolved to do is replace human connection with addiction. Have we now become biologically wired for addiction? Our phone addictions would be one of the ways many people now seek connection and a hit of dopamine. One of the tools that they present to people who are struggling with addiction is an acronym that's pretty well known in the field of addictions called HALT. So HALT, if you're having a craving to use, stop and ask yourself, am I hungry? Am I angry? Am I lonely? Am I tired? Very interesting how loneliness is a factor there. The article then goes into neurogenetics of loneliness. And it says that understanding why some lonely individuals become addicted following exposure to addictive drugs and or behaviors while others do not remains a major challenge in devising science-driven interventions in addiction medicine and mental health. It goes on to say that individuals with autism spectrum disorders, bipolar, major depression, schizophrenia, tend to have lower sociability scores. The sociability score was found to be significantly heritable. The sociability score demonstrated negative genetic correlations with autism, depression, schizophrenia, loneliness, and social anxiety. I recently polled my Instagram community where close to 1,500 people viewed the story and around 500 responded to the poll. First, I wanted to ask them how many of them consider themselves lonely right now. Then I asked them if they were socially isolated. 43% of the people who responded to the poll said they were. 34% said a little. And 23% of people who responded to the poll said no. So then I wanted to know from there, those people who did say they were lonely, how long have they been feeling that way? 7% said they were only feeling that way in the last month. 9% said in the last three to six months. Over a year, 38% and forever, 45%. Then I asked them, how long have you been feeling socially isolated? 7% said in the last three months, 11% said in the last year, 36% said over a year, and 45% said my whole life. It truly speaks to the genetic quality of the loneliness factor, especially if the majority of people are saying that they've been feeling that way their whole life. Now, while I was reading this article on the genetic impact on our genes, I came across an acronym ETL, which stands for the Evolutionary Theory of Loneliness. So, of course, I had to go down that little rabbit hole and find out more. 
that beneficial social interactions and reliable social relationships can contribute to the likelihood of survival, reproduction, and consequent genetic legacy. So the evolutionary theory of loneliness, which suggests that loneliness is an inherited adaptation that signals a threat to social connections and motivates individuals to reconnect with others. The exploration of the genetic basis of loneliness has been greatly influenced by the fundamental principles of the ETL, prompting researchers to delve deeper into the genetic roots of this emotion. And they discovered that social environmental factors like low social support can significantly affect feelings of loneliness, especially in individuals who have sensitive variants of certain candidate genes. And that tells me neurodivergent people. They're the ones who have these sensitive variants. Another article I came across called The Evolutionary Mechanisms for Loneliness. Loneliness may feel like it has no redeeming features, but it may have evolved as an aversive state that like hunger, thirst, and pain promotes our behavior to change to increase the likeliness of our survival. So the thing is, is we're feeling this emotion, but it's not always prompting us to go and seek that social connection for our survival. It's like we're self-sabotaging ourselves. What is in the way of us acting on that primitive response to loneliness? Well, the evolutionary theory of loneliness says that loneliness makes people feel not only unhappy, but also unsafe. So could we be feeling unsafe to go and form those connections? It's having this double-sided, double-edged sword effect. The theory presented this chart and this chart I took a look at and what it reminded me of, because you look at the social environment and there's either this repulsion and isolation or there's an attraction and connection. What this diagram reminded me of was the disorganized attachment style. Rats exposed to maternal separation stress displayed a threefold increase in ethanol consumption over a three week period. Early life stress is connected to behaviors associated with addiction and a sense of loneliness. These rats also exhibited depressive like symptoms and anhedonia, which are clinically associated with the construct of loneliness. The article on the genetics of loneliness says that genes inherited at birth from parents determine a hardwired portion of the perception and responsivity to loneliness, as well as the potential to develop loneliness-induced neuropsychiatric and or medical morbidity. Look at all those people who consider themselves lonely, and you might find a trail of family members that have carried on that emotional state as well. Also, what is true is that neurodiversity is hereditary. You have a kid with autism? Okay which one of your parents also has it. And for autistic people, we don't isolate because we don't like connection. The truth is that it's overstimulating and to engage in social connection requires days of recovery to follow. So if they're saying we're biologically wired for connection, but so many of us have, I guess, faulty wiring because we're not connecting, we're disconnecting and we're disconnecting through addictions and then having difficulty being productive because people aren't showing up to work, or maybe they are showing up to work, but there's also a thing called presenteeism. You're there, but you're not really there. So I'm only on page nine of this document, but I'm really starting to wonder how many people who are lonely and socially disconnected are all neurodivergent people of this world. Because when you're telling me how our brains have been wired, well, what about the neurodivergent brain? Our wiring is just not firing the same as everyone else's. And when you say those basic needs like water, food, shelter, this is where the ableist stuff is revealing itself. I may have a need that doesn't seem basic to you. Sensory needs and emotional needs. Our ancestors were not facing homelessness and complex trauma and attachment disorders. I have to say that our brains have been adapting toward more social isolation and there's a reason for it. This report seems to be highlighting that if we don't fix our social connection problem and get it back to the way it used to be, this will be to our detriment. But the detriment is to the outdated ways our society is choosing to operate. Just look at all the people who love working from home 
if you get up in arms having to go to the office. Again, we're approaching the societal paradigm shift where many of us are discovering new freedoms as a way to move from a strict and conservative society to one that's more liberal and open-minded, inclusive and innovative, building a society that supports the management of people who are lonely and prone to higher levels of alcoholism or general addiction. You know, the way our society has romanticized alcohol and the way we sell it as a way to de-stress from your weekend, to celebrate any occasion, um, and using alcohol as a way to socially connect. I think that's where the paradigm shift has to take place. Well, that's all for today's episode. There's a lot to take in and consider, and I know it's not sounding too hopeful at the moment. I assure you that there is hope. And I will have a list of recommendations that we as individuals can apply immediately in our lives that do not require government action. See you in the next episode.